Hello? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and I really uh, appreciate the invitation. It's the chance to see so many friends and meet new people as well. But uh, especially the friends from 30 years ago when this all started for me and for many of us. Uh, actually, I came here yesterday. I got here around noon for, or, or 1 o'clock for, for lunch. And ironically, I was only about six miles away for the morning session, except it was in that direction. I was flying over uh, <laughs> three more hours. Um, so I'm going to talk about this subject, but I wanted to mention a couple of things first. One of them is this book, which I have here. It came out in, in uh, last June, and uh, it's certainly about stuff of interest to many of you here. There's a few of the diagrams in it, and uh, uh, including uh, revivals by semi-classical means there in the middle. And there's another book which uh, is was actually inspired, wouldn't have happened without the, this community and the, and the things I learned from it, and that's this book on acoustics. Um, it's so I didn't bring it because it's too heavy. It's 600 and some pages. And uh, there are a lot of stories in there which would be very recognizable uh, to many, most of you. Um, so it is pretty well known that Schrodinger solved the coherent state wave packet problem in 1926. It wasn't the first quantum mechanics paper, uh, but he had a nice picture of a Gaussian wave packet there. He knew all about sloshing back and forth without changing shape and so on. And I've been working with Gaussians for many years, but it suddenly dawned on me that uh, well, I haven't been taking advantage of them in uh, many body physics as much as I should. Uh, this is the first post-Schrodinger correspondence principle. Of course, there are many before the Schrodinger equation, which we still use, but uh, this is the first one after the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and uh, I want to talk today about some new perspective and solid state processes using the Schrodinger correspondence. And uh, this led me to concerns about the way momentum is handled or not handled for uh, problems dealing with uh, electron and, and phonon uh, conductivity. So I'll get to that. Uh, let's start with this uh, sort of a warm-up problem, but it's amazingly instructive. At least it was for me. Imagine this uh, line of atoms, uh, masses connected by harmonic springs, floating freely on the space shuttle. It's got no motion until I walk up to it and smoothly push on one end and I withdraw my hand, no more force. And what will happen, of course, is that uh, some kind of pulse, I wouldn't call it a phonon, there's no wave vector here, uh, starts traveling down the uh, chain. I have imparted momentum to the whole chain, which all resides here, mechanical momentum. The center of mass is moving, and now what we'll think about um, is no more force will be applied. Uh, you can go into the center of mass frame, and then, of course, the atoms not involved in the pulse will be drifting slightly backwards to keep the total momentum zero of the center of mass. But I want to ask this question, what happens when this pulse hits the free end? It's a free end. And this isn't the answer. The things, of course, you know, the momentum must stay the same. And something has to reflect from the end. So what is it? What happens? Yes, Uzi? Sorry? Center of mass is, gonna, is moving and will not change one iota its motion, of course. There's no, there's no force, external force on this system after that initial push.
the momentum of individual atoms will have to change, but the center of mass won't change. You agree with that? Nobody's put a force on it. There's there's rules about these things. You know, I, there's no external force. <laughs> <laughs> It's free, both free. We just had 10 candidates for an open position in the physics department. I interviewed nine of them. I asked all 10 this question, nobody got it. But I was quickly, quickly told them I was confused, you know, for 10 days or something about this. Uh, and then I realized, oh, it's in my acoustics book. What happens is a pulse reflects, but it's an anti-pulse. The momentum stays the same. Even the individual atoms still point the momentum in the same direction. But what happens at the moment of the collision of the pulse with the end is the last atom goes way out. There's nothing to push against. And it starts pulling on the next atom, and that one pulls on its next atom, and the anti-pulse goes the other way. Momentum stays the same. Now, this is an example of what you can learn. Try and do this with A's and A daggers. Try and do this with late raising and lowering operators. This is physical motion of a chain and is exactly quantum mechanical because of Schrodinger correspondence. So this antipulse was a very good case to be made that is an antiparticle. If you thought, call the first pulse a particle, it has higher mass density. Its motion and momentum are in the same direction. This has lower than average mass density, and its motion and uh, momentum are in the opposite direction from each other. So it's an antiparticle. But this is exactly what happens for air in a tube. If I tap the end of one end of the tube and this pulse of positive pressure hits the open end, it comes back as a pulse of lower than average pressure. Yes. I'm sorry about my hearing. Ah, uh, I haven't thought much about longitudinal, but I think that also happens longitudinally if it's free end. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you must have been asking about transverse. This is longitudinal. Thank you. Did you mean transverse? Well, I mean, I'm. Look, you can argue about terms and whether this is even reasonable to define, but it sure as hell is analogous to an antiparticle. It's got negative mass. It's going momentum and motion exactly opposite. And moreover, this is not just a thought experiment. Um, it will be if I don't restart this. Click on the wrong button. So the Mossbauer effect. Uh, you've got an iron 57 guest atom in a crystal, or it could be just a piece of paraffin. doesn't matter. And uh, suddenly emits a gamma ray after going through uh, a radiative, a, a, uh, a nuclear reaction just before. But then it sits there for microseconds or whatever and emits a gamma ray. And uh, it gives itself a nice kick in the opposite direction of the gamma ray. And if you look up Mossbauer effect, you'll have a hard time finding the, the interesting aspects of it because it's used for chemistry. And you'll see spectra like this, which looks really boring. This is a sharp line. And uh, this is the amount of Geiger or radiative intensity in some counter versus, and then it gets interesting, speed in millimeters per second. This is uh, this block of material is em emitting, and, and, and this atom is getting a kick. But all this block of material has plenty of ground state iron 57s ready to absorb this, and the cross section is enormous. So if there is a, a piece of iron here and uh, 57, and, and you don't move it, the Geiger counter gets plenty of counts because. Uh, it gets fewer, sorry, fewer counts 
because there's, there's a bunch of the, not all, but a bunch of the gamma rays are resonantly absorbed by the iron 57 here. There's gamma rays which are not resonantly absorbed, and I'll tell you about them in a second. When this line is so intense and so narrow, first of all, let's talk about intensity. Here's the actual experimental spectrum. This pip, they call it, uh, this graph goes to 4. This pip goes to 2,115 at 4 degrees Kelvin. It contains about 80% of the intensity. This is an incredibly elastic, demonstrably elastic peak, and it was the discovery of that peak that gave Musbar the Nobel Prize. Uh, what is this? Well, if you kick this atom, classically, you've done something. You can't avoid it. Energy has been absorbed in the kick. But quantum mechanically, 80% of the time, nothing's happened except the center of mass had to have recoiled to uh, maintain momentum conservation. It's given a terrible name. This PIP component is called recoilless emission, which is exactly opposite what it should be. Well, actually, no matter whether or not there is phonon produced, the center of mass must recoil to maintain uh, momentum. I mean, a phonon doesn't get you off the hook. And we're going to talk about that a lot in the next few minutes. Um, so these are all the inelastic transitions that gave various amounts of momentum to locally in the lattice and did change the quantum state of the lattice uh, demonstrably within microseconds, within nanoseconds or so. You can tell if this happened or not because you can you have a fast Geiger counter, you, you find the click. If you heard the click, it wasn't a uh, PIP event. It was a non-PIP event. A phonon got created. It's interesting. I don't know what to make of this. It's interesting quantum measurement theory. The presence of a phonon, uh, and therefore the recoil of the center of mass, can be detected within a nanosecond long before the pulse could ever reach even the end of the crystal. And I've led to myself to this point at this moment. Um, if you ever say to yourself, okay, here you have a crystal floating in the space shuttle. Let's suppose it has zero momentum. Stop right there. Have you ever seen a crystal with zero momentum? That's a plane wave. You don't know where it is. So you have to start thinking about what it means to know where an object is, even if it's floating in space. So this is why there's this elastic component. It starts in one dimension. And of course, you have to go further. Uh, and the neutron scattering theory, this is well understood, and Mossbauer as well. If I k suddenly give a momentum kick to a harmonic oscillator or any oscillator, uh, uh, it's like boosting it in momentum space. But if I don't boost it too much and I measure it, there's a good chance I'm going to find it back in the ground state quantum mechanically. And that's just exactly what's going on. And that property is not. Reduce is not it's surprising because of all the low frequency modes you think you think might spoil this, but actually it, it does get spoiled in one dimension, but in two and three dimensions there's enough self uh, confinement of atoms of the collection of atoms that it, uh, you get this 80 percent chance of no no phonon being produced. Momentum conserved, no phonon. So here's a one-dimensional chain calculation. Uh, I actually did this. I'll show you the calculation. But let's suppose the, pho the photon gets sent that way, and the kick is therefore this way. And this is interesting. Here's our anti-pulse. Anti it happens every time there's a Mossbauer emission. Of course, you think about the compression that happens this way, and this compressive disturbance travels in the direction you'd expect. I forgot anyway. I think everybody <laughs> forgot that there has to be an antipulse going the other way. Because you're pulling, you're stretching this spring, and that's going to stretch the next guy, and that's going to go that way. They both have momentum in the same direction. They're each responsible for half the momentum that's imparted to the crystal. They each travel at the same velocity. So I did a little calculation. 
and uh, it's easiest to see here if you average the momentum, it, it gets kind of noisy, atom by atom, but if you average over atoms, uh, this is the momentum density. It's always pointing, in this case, from right to left. And the right to left momentum density is traveling with equal amplitude and velocity to the left to, to, to on both sides of the event. So this kind of information, you can think of it as trivial. Maybe it's important. It's hidden in standard treatments of the harmonic oscillator problem. It's hidden in condensed matter theory textbooks, which are 90% harmonic oscillator when it comes to the phonon. Uh, so what, what is a phonon, though? This is a pulse of some sort. If we take that same floating chain and we push and pull on it periodically, ah, now we have a phonon. There's a wave vector, and there's no momentum. I'm pulling as much as I'm pushing. There's energy. There's a wave vector. There's exactly no momentum. And this is something which is in good textbooks is correctly stated. Phonons have no momentum. But even in the best textbooks, later somewhere you'll find they're using the phonon to balance the momentum kick that, give, that they gave it to some electron, which is just plain wrong. And it's just traditional. So. Uh, let's look at this in a moment on the computer. Um, there is pseudo-momentum for this phonon, which is not mechanical uh, and implies zero mechanical momentum. Uh, I have a clock on each atom there. The gray circle shows the equilibrium positions of the atoms. You can see on the upper track here that there is some compression traveling. It will see, you will see in this direction, left, left to right. And this tells us the phase of oscillation of the atom. The amplitude you can see by the amount of compression. You see the amplitude is larger here. These white lines are also larger. Uh, this has these two pulses. This one's much stronger, more energetic than this one. Have the same pseudo momentum, and it's the same quantum mechanically and classically because of Schrodinger correspondence. This pseudo-momentum is actually a result of a symmetry. The symmetry is not like most books say, oh, let's translate the lattice carefully by one lattice vector. That's pretty silly because that you, what about 0.76 lattice vectors? That's, all, that's, the, that's this total center of mass momentum they're talking about. The right symmetry is translation of the disturbance by one lattice vector. Um, so there is energy flux. The direction of energy flow is given by the wave vector. And separately, energy is conserved. So the flux, the energy flux is controlled by the pseudo-momentum. And if there is pseudo-momentum conservation, and there is, even if there are enharmonicities in the crystal, as long as those enharmonicities are the same everywhere, it's a uniform, perfect crystal, then the symmetry of the translation of the disturbance holds. Pseudo-momentum is conserved. Pyrrhals realized, wait a minute, that means at least for very long wavelengths or uh, low temperature phonons, I can combine them. Two could make a third that's even a shorter wavelength, pseudo-momentum wavelength. But um, pseudo-momentum is conserved and energy flux is controlled by K. Wait a minute, there's no energy reflection. The energy is just going to keep going exactly in the same direction with the same flux it was going in before which means thermal conductivity shouldn't be infinite. And it was Pyros who figured out what happened. Um, so the Pyros started worrying about the equilibration of phonons at low temperature. They have a source of phonons, maybe have a hot surface. How do they equilibrate? Do they ever equilibrate? And he knew about rough edges and things like that, but he thought they ought to be able to equilibrate somehow internally in the crystal. And Thereby, the concept of, of uh, umklop scattering was born. So let me show you a little bit about umklop. Let's try illustrating it. This is a little simulation, a few lines in uh, Mathematica. And I have here a, a bit of a a few atoms, and again, I show their equilibrium position and the phase of the oscillation 
and we can uh, evolve the time. And you can sort of see already that there's a pulse traveling left to right. If I add more atoms, that becomes more apparent. And let me just. Uh, you can see it's almost like Newton's balls in this case. It's going from left to right. Uh, if I take the, uh, th this is somewhere in the middle of the first Brillouin zone. If I go, if I go to the uh, middle of the first Brillouin zone, not at the middle exactly, but you see, whatever energy transfer is taking place, and there's a little bit because I'm not quite at the middle. Uh, it's going very slowly now, and mostly the atoms are beating against each other. That's at the end of the Brillouin zone. Uh, if you read about pseudo-momentum, most textbooks will say it's not a real momentum because you can always add a reciprocal lattice vector to it, so it couldn't be a real momentum. And this is, this is uh, not exactly false, but it's, it's a poor excuse for an explanation. The real explanation is that if you just conserve pseudo-momentum and go beyond the Brillouin zone, the energy goes backward. So you can add two pseudo-momenta that together put you over the first Brillouin zone, and automatically, without a physicist having to add a reciprocal lattice vector, the energy goes backwards. And this is what limits uh, thermal conductivity. So you get the nonlinear effects, they're, they're anharmonic terms in crystals, and the energy will start to go backwards and limit the conductivity of the uh, of the crystal the thermal conductivity. Is there a question about that? Um, okay, so that's called umklopf scattering, and uh, Pyrrhus uh, was the first to notice it. Um, here is a non-umklopf event, which leads to infinite thermal resistance. The thermal conductivity, if you, if you thought that's all that happened. Uh, but there are these events which, uh, you could, if you wish, you can add the reciprocal lattice vector and see that it's going backwards. But the, the blue square is the Brillouin zone. And that, that event on the right went beyond the Brillouin zone. We had to bring it back with a reciprocal lattice vector. And we have now the energy uh, flow controlled by the green arrow, which is uh, reversed its direction. Uh, okay. Starting to think about equilibration, Pyrrhus' original question, you can ask, with the Schrodinger correspondence, what is the distribution of coherent states that would give you e to the minus beta h thermal distribution? And it turns out, unfortunately, it's not the classical equilibrated distribution that does that. Uh, you, m you would hope that maybe you could bootstrap the classical to the quantum because of quantum interference of the coherent states, but it's not quite right. And this is the distribution of coherent states. There's more than one way to, there's more than one answer to this because of the non-orthogonality of the coherent states, but this one is the most compact, I believe, that reduces to a delta function at zero Kelvin. Uh, and uh, this weighting of each of the coherent states uh, is easy got the right limits at high temperature and low temperature and so on spend too much more time on that. But this has started to think, of, you know, started us thinking about momentum. And it turns out this is, as, as, this, as this say, uh, Blount says, uh, the, the argument has not, it is true, been carried out at high volume, but the list of disputants is very distinguished. Rayleigh, Pointing, Ehrenfest, Brillouin, Minkowski, Pauli. that they don't agree with each other. How has this momentum business been, th been thrown under the rug? Um, so, to give you the bottom line, I'm not just worried about definitions and getting them right. There are two effects of clearing this up, which are definitely important, I think, in condensed matter physics. One of them is that the low temperature resistivity of electrons and metals is not caused by one phonon inelastic transitions, but is almost entirely elastic. And secondly, and this is, this is absolute heresy, and there's another heretical statement made here. 
uh, electron hole pair transitions in solids where you have an indirect transition. So the bottom of the conduction band is not directly above in momentum space the top of the valence band. So every book will say, oh, you can do it, but you need a phonon. And, and it's interesting, it's sort of disappointing, every book and all but two papers I found in literature actually leave it there as if it was an explanation of something. That's a conservation law. That's not an explanation of the mechanism. You need matrix elements. Uh, so it turns out you don't even need a phonon. Normally, you do need a phonon for uh, a large uh, change in uh, wave vector unless the temperature is very high. Uh, so here's the original sin. This is what got us all in trouble is the particle in the box. None of those states have any momentum. But I can make, it's a complete set, I can make wave packets with plenty of momentum. How come? Well, there was never any momentum conservation. There's no translational symmetry. It's gone. So that's not a problem. Uh, but in Ashcroft and Roman and every other book I've seen, they're written like this. Uh, there's an equilibrium position for each atom and the displacement, end of story. Let's start doing phonons. Center of mass is gone from the picture. You are living in a dangerous world of the particle in the box where momentum may disappear or you might invoke phony reasons for you conserving momentum when it isn't conserved in your, in your picture. Okay, so if they use that excuse, it's, it's kind of because it really won't matter to the crystal if it's on a table. Uh, the same processes will happen inside a 10 centimeter crystal, whether it's on a table or not. That's one. Secondly, momentum is still the same issue. The crystal doesn't recoil, but then the table does, then the floor does, and the lab does, then the earth does. It's all, if you hit a battleship with a BB, the recoil of the BB is exactly the momentum transferred to the battleship. It doesn't matter whether it's floating in the space shuttle or not. All right, so uh, you don't seem convinced. <laughs> I mean, uh, if I have a crystal this big and it's floating in a space shuttle and something happens 10 centimeters inside, you, you think it's not going to happen if it's on a table? Yes, the momentum has a different history after the event. And that's another way this problem is buried. Some people will tell me, oh, but the crystal is infinite. Well, that's burying the problem another way. Uh, I take the limit of a very large crystal to infinity, but then get the answer right before you take the limit which is you have to worry about the momentum of the crystal. So this is the right way to do particle in the box. Um, nothing is buried. You have total translational symmetry of the box walls, which have mass and may even be flexible. You can think of them as a phonons. And uh, the particle inside has its own mass and position. You put everything in center of mass coordinate. And sorry did it wrong. Everything in lab coordinates. So there's no ambiguity about what you're talking about. The whole thing is uh, translationally symmetric. You have a total center of mass. You have a center of mass of what I like to call the background, which is everything except the foreground. If you're thinking about an electron and its, its deflection inside a crystal, that electron is the foreground and everything else is the background. There are some surprises when you do this. And some things just clarify immediately. So many statements in the textbooks about the momentum aren't clear about which they're talking about. So here is the particle in the box for a crystal. The crystal ends in, at the slide here. It's a small crystal. And there is an electron that's actually a wave. You see it there. 
with its own center of mass in the laboratory, its own momentum, and there is a, that's the system, I'm sorry, that's the foreground, the background is everything else except the electron, and it's got a center of mass, and it's got a momentum. And the interesting thing is, the foreground electron in a crystal has a pseudo-momentum. Uh, it's a different kind of pseudo-momentum. It's a different beast. It won't even interbreed with the pseudo-momentum we just talked about for phonons, in spite of the fact attempts are often made to make them talk to each other. It's a translational pseudo-momentum. It's sim very simple. I mean, if I'm an electron, I feel this bumpy potential. I can't possibly conserve the old mechanical momentum. So what have I got instead? I have a pseudo-momentum. I just do translations by unit, by, by lattice vector. It's very close to me mechanical momentum. If you wanted to plot the mechanical momentum, you'd just see it oscillating nicely as it goes over the bumpy potential. So it's, it's a mechanical type momentum. If you, uh, and many textbooks will say, well, let's add a reciprocal lattice vector to the uh, electron momentum. After all, it's a pseudo momentum. That's just wrong, okay? It does look like it's necessary if you're doing tight binding or, or a restricted number of orbitals per atom. Then how can you describe a fast electron? You think you need, oh, the electron has too high a wavelength. I guess I better put it back in the Brillouin zones that I have. And you have just a few of them if you've got a few orbitals. Uh, if you have one atom per unit cell and one orbital per atom, you have only one Brillouin zone. And uh, you can't describe a fast electron correctly. You could describe a fast electron going through your crystal uh, and out the other side uh, if you had lots and lots of orbitals per atom. That's a different problem. And that's the way it should be done. You cannot add pseudomomenta to the electron. Uh, but it, yeah. Ah, we have a ring. I, I, I forget. I, I'll, I'll open up those slides if they're not there. We have a ring. So um, it's interesting. And this, this pseudo-momentum is pretty well understood for electrons. And, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's not stated very often that it's nearly a mechanical momentum. But I think people know. However, the background has also got a pseudo-momentum. What is that symmetry? I fix the electron and move the background. Bump, 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 bumpy potential. The background's got a pseudo-momentum. The sum of the two pseudo-momenta is the total momentum of the whole system. Uh, it's important to know this. And I'm going to jump ahead and may not ever get to this. But this is something we're very excited about. This is uh, uh, this form of the wave function, many-body wave function for a crystal plus the electron is suggested by some time-dependent tight binding calculations that uh, Vipab Mohanty uh, in my group did. He's an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, he, he showed us that nuclei move. We don't make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation if you're doing time-dependent tight binding. And we found the electrons are lazy. They just stick around and don't do much while the, uh, while the uh, nuclei move, which had better be true or every condensed matter physics textbook needs to be put in the garbage, which of course it doesn't. Why do people have the right to take the high symmetry positions for all the atoms, nail them down, and talk only about that when even within zero point energy there's all sorts of asymmetric situations? If Born Oppenheimer were correct, trouble. Um, let's go back to Mathematica. This is just a schematic, but it shows the phase in a square lattice of the atoms in a, it's not moving, oh, but yeah. The phase, just as the e to the i theta phase 0 to 2 pi is red back to red, and that's the phase of the wave function, not the amplitude, in some highly excited state. Uh, block, uh, well, this isn't a block wave because one of the atoms has been moved. And there's all these, that's what a band diagram looks like. If, if you just ask, well, what's a contour mean in the band diagram? It means all those states have the same energy. Well, what are those states? Well, they have definite pseudo momenta. That's what you're plotting against. 
okay, I just destroyed the pseudo-momentum by moving an atom. All those states will mix. And that means if I move even one atom, I'm going to show you what happens to the wave function. I'm moving it by nanometer. No, tenths of nanometers. That's what's happening to the Born-Oppenheimer wave function. It can't, it can't follow that. It can't do that. It's just going to sit there and say whatever and let the, and let the, <laughs> and this is what Weibob found. He's doing time dependent type binding, classical mechanics for the nuclei, which isn't that far from the truth as we've been seeing with Schrodinger corresponding. And um, he's finding the electrons wave function stays about the same for hundreds of vibrational carbon carbon stretch periods in graphene. So this wave function. encodes that. Uh, this part of it encodes the momentum conservation. There's, uh, this is, these are laboratory coordinates for the electron, for the center of mass, the electron foreground, center of mass background. It's only the difference that matters in the potential of interaction between the two. And so whenever I change the wave vector of the electron, by whatever means, I change automatically the background and conserve momentum. That's the form the wave function should take in every textbook. Momentum is now taken care of. If you, want, if you worry about the total center of mass momentum, it's usually not important unless a neutron is flying through. But there it is also. And then there is this. It looks exactly like, in fact, all of this looks exactly like the usual block wave. What's different? What's different is you just, we just realize, set them free to move. Don't change the wave function. That's a diabatic wave function. And that's what our numerical calculations are, ta are telling us. It's not adiabatic, it's diabatic. These nuclei can move around. We haven't changed anything except effectively R will peak around Rj for each of the orbitals. And, effect and the, these are adiabatic in the sense that we are allowing the nuclei to drag their orbitals with them. And it's diabatic in the sense we're not taking the pi electron cloud to change just because the not by much. There is some change. If I drag this, this orbital around, uh, this phase effectively changes a little bit because this peaks up right near R equals Rj. So if Rj has moved, then this phase moves a little bit. So we're very excited about using this. It's so easy to use this form in calculations. You just start doing calculations. And you can use it as a, as a complete set, so you can start doing electron nuclear calculations with this as well. Oh, so this is the harmonic, so this is for harmonic oscillators, doesn't need to be. So this is the, sorry, I should have said this. These Cs are just linear combinations of these. These are the normal modes built out of these atomic positions. So this is all a function of the big Rs, even though it doesn't look like it. And these are the Hermi polynomials. Thank you. Um, so I'm now going to tell you that um, this diagram that is universally sort of everywhere about an electron changing momentum and a phonon being responsible um, due to an inelastic transition where you have to match energy and momentum, it's just wrong. I mean, this can happen. There's no doubt it happens. And you have to worry about energy and momentum conservation if it happens. But this is what happens most of the time. Remember, the background can immediately accept momentum changes of something in the foreground. It doesn't have to. In fact, the phonon doesn't even have momentum. So you can't use it to balance the momentum of an electron directional change. So we need a new picture like this where the double arrow means, oh yeah, the background took up the momentum. And but notice there's no change in energy of the electron. So here's another original sin, a beautiful paper by Bardeen and Shockley uh, on what became known as uh, the standard, well, it's a standard model for low temperature resistivity of metals. And this, one's, uh, this paper's about semiconductors but there are very strong similarities in the two cases. They defined block wave for the wave function. 
they said there's this deformation potential, which is simply phonons are running around. There's regions in the crystal where the atoms are a little bit closer together because of accidents of which phonons are there, a little bit farther apart somewhere else. This modulates the band structure and causes the electrons to see hills and valleys uh, in its propagation through the metal. And those hills and valleys are moving slowly, about 1 100th the speed of the electron. This is important. However, I read this and said, oh my goodness, the original paper got it right. And then I read the rest of this paragraph. The transitions from P, I mean, all they, they had it right. Here's the total deformation potential. Here's a couple of wave functions. I mean, I wouldn't use perturbation theory. We're about to use semi-classics. But, but if you wanted to use perturbation theory, this is right. And then they said, oh, it can only cause one phonon transitions. This is really silly because it's silly because if you have a hot thermal cavity with radiation in it and you're going to throw an electron through there, uh, the radiation field is classical. So is this phonon field. And th the electron is going to feel random dis disturbances. Who would calculate that by one photon perturbation theory? And yet that's what they're doing. And the tradition got established here in this paper. They forgot that the crystal could absorb the momentum directly, like most power scattering. So this is a beautiful recent experiment by my colleague Philip Kim uh, for graphene. They show the T to the fourth low temperature uh, resistivity in, in graphene rolling over to T at higher temperature. And uh, uh, it's T to the fifth in three-dimensional materials rolling over to T. What's happening is uh, the temperature is low enough down here that you haven't even occupied many of the uh, uh, phonon modes. They're, they're too high frequency to be occupied by the Bose-Einstein factor. So they're continuously being occupied as I raise the temperature. That causes the resistivity to go up much faster. And then it rolls over to the classically up here all the bulls are classically occupied. OK. So uh, I better move on uh, and just tell you some results. Uh, this is what the deformation potential looks like. It scales beautifully with temperature. And if you use it and do semi-classics on this deformation potential uh, using the transverse kicks uh, that the deformation potential will give, transferring no energy to the electron, uh, and ask, how does momentum diffuse? Uh, you get t to the fourth in three dimensions and t to the fifth. t to the fifth in three dimensions and t to the fourth in two dimensions in one page. The history of deriving this t to the fourth and t to the fifth is very fraught with approximations and funny literature. Uh, so. Finally, I want to mention this deformation potential will give rise to branch flow of the electrons. And uh, this is examples of branch flow. And uh, I've got a postdoc working on this now. Branch flow actually happens in crystals and thin films. And this is what's happening to the electrons, and semi-classically speaking, in the crystal. Of course, you have a periodic emission from the other side, so you still see the Bragg peaks. But the Bragg peaks will scintillate, I believe, in a thin crystal if you if you change the uh, angle because of branch flow. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to leave it there. And uh, to recap, I'll just let you read that because I'm over time. And I want to thank, uh, thank my collaborators. Vibhav, I've mentioned, Dong Wong Kim, uh, has been working closely on the stuff I talked about. And uh, the, the, the postdoc I just mentioned is Alvar. He's, he's very talented, and uh, uh, I thank them, the National Science Foundation, and all of you for your attention. It really is good to be here. <laughs>